thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody that's also joined us online and um, for everybody joining post-refreshment break. Uh, so I have about 20 minutes to walk you through a light topic of, of operationalizing zero trust in the era of AI. Um, and I, and I, I've heard a, a number of the other presentations earlier today, and, and these are themes that have come up consistently. And I think you'll see some of the things that I talk about um, kind of mirror what a lot of people have talked about. Um, looking at the agenda, um, I'm going to walk through. First, I want to sort of level set on a definition of zero trust. Because I think in a lot of these conversations, uh, you ask 100 people for a defini definition of zero trust, and you get 100 different answers. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of talk through that. Um, next, we'll look at a framework for managing the complexities of zero trust with IoT. How do we actually put it into practice? Uh, and then lastly, uh, maybe a discussion about how AI impacts the way we think about zero trust and, and what are the implications for advances in AI um, across IoT. So I always like to, to start with, the, with this NIST definition, because um, this is actually the abstract that NIST wrote when they published the Zero Trust uh, framework a while back. Um, because I think when you ask people to describe Zero Trust, uh, they still unfortunately take a, a very hardware and network-centric approach. And they think Zero Trust means that I harden my network perimeter and I create these secure, trusted enclaves to prevent bad actors from moving laterally once they've breached the network perimeter. Um, and that's not ex actually what NIST was intending. Um, NIST was thinking about it differently. Uh, NIST, NIST thinks, how do we actually look at all of the things that are connecting into us and treat each of those as separate entities that have to be controlled? Uh, because in, in this new era, especially within IoT, you can no longer count on um, the physical location of, of a device to determine its security posture and whether it's trustworthy. And I think just in summary, for when we think about a definition of zero trust, it's identity being the new perimeter. And this is something that I think you've probably heard several times today. But if you're a security leader in today's environment, it's not easy. Um, identity is, is, is not a single thing. It's actually, um, there are three very distinct and separate um, par parts of identity that have to be managed distinctly, right? So there's human identities. We're all pretty familiar with that. Um, but you have a human that's taking some responsibility for the life cycle of, of their credential. You have this growing category of machine identities, um, which you know, has come up in the last few years. And these are essentially non-human entities um, that could be mainstream IoT devices, a laptop, a mobile device, um, could be a server um, as part of your network infrastructure. It could be a software application or an API, some, some digital non-human entity. And the third category, which is where we at Device Authority focus on, is IoT device identities. And these are different because um, while they're related to machine identities in, in that they're non-human, um, often digital, um, but in, in a lot of cases, because of their context and scale, they require a radically different approach, one that, that needs automation um, to, to manage effectively. Because in this really complex environment of IoT device identities is where we've, we've found that the current state of, of the cybersecurity industry. Um, I like to cite this report from Verizon. They, they release it every year. Um, but essentially, they've, they've shown that um, over three quarters of breaches are a direct result of human error. And those humans that are committing those errors are the people that we, we typically entrust to actually provide the security that we, that we put in place, right? And you can't blame them, they are humans, but we're talking about very, very scaled, very complex environments. And, and sometimes that error is something as simple as defining the wrong policy for a group of devices or exposing those device credentials to the wrong application or the wrong group of people. Um, but in, in either case, um, identity or those credentials um, are responsible for you know, roughly, roughly half of the breaches that are occurring today. And unfortunately, as we've seen, you know, the industry is not very forgiving. Um, so you know, you're, you're all very familiar with the SolarWinds hack that happened a while back. Um, and this actually just was a press release that came from the SEC within the last week or so, uh, where the CISO is actually being charged with fraud and, and other, other charges. So. Um, simply saying the environment is too complex 
um, and we can't manage it easily is, is not enough. And in fact, I think, uh, unfortunately, in his case, there was some damning evidence that actually had SolarWinds employees sending emails to each other saying, geez, I hope we can withstand an attack while this person's on vacation, right? So, so this is the reality of, of where we exist today. And so for zero trust, uh, at least in the U.S., you know, they've, uh, CISA has released this zero trust maturity model, which I think most people are familiar with, um, that looks at how do, we, how do we take into account identities, devices, the networks that they're connecting to, the applications they're talking to, and all the data they're generating, and have some accountability and some trust built in. Um, and, and ultimately, um, the, the highest level, the optimal stage, uh, requires uh, full automation and continuous assurance of those identities. Um, so this is, this is sort of what's driving um, the market today. I think most organizations you talk to have a zero trust project in place. And I think they struggle with, okay, how do I actually put this into practice? Where do I start? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. So I always like to kind of fall back on, on a, a model that pretty much everybody is familiar with the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, the thing to remember about zero trust is it's not a thing. It's actually a paradigm. It's, it's an approach. It's sort of aspirational. Um, but it all backs up to the NIST cybersecurity framework. And the challenge today is that most cybersecurity platforms pick a couple of spots on the cybersecurity framework and say, this is zero trust. And they typically are detect and respond technologies, which are very, very important However, we know from the definition of zero trust, you can't just wait for a breach to happen and then try to correct it. You actually have to take proactive steps to assign identities to those resources that are connecting and hopefully head off a threat before it happens through that, that process. Um, so if you think about it a different way, think about automating zero trust and trying to reach this level of cyber resilience, you think holistically about the NIST cybersecurity framework and start with creating that foundation, which is identity. Apply your zero trust security policies to all of the devices, users, assets, and resources that are trying to connect. Bring in that external threat intelligence so that you can be aware of known CVEs that are out there and, and take corrective actions, but then have a strong response plan, right? How am I actually gonna automate some of these actions. If I know that there's a potential breach, well, then I ought to automate um, you know, the quarantining of those devices, take them offline so that more damage can't be done. And then I think most importantly, how am I patching those vulnerabilities and getting those devices back online? Because if you're an organization that relies on IoT devices across your supply chain and they're down, you want to get back to your operational state as quickly as possible. And if you're relying on humans to do that, especially for devices that exist at great scale, oftentimes at the edge and in remote environments, you can't send a person out to do this stuff manually. So automation becomes absolutely critical. And so through our, our many years, Device Authority has been providing zero trust capabilities to, to IoT customers since 2015. Um, we've come up with a couple of things. One is a framework that we call the nine core capabilities. These are the specific things that organizations can look at to help them achieve zero trust and then pair it with the IoT um, device lifecycle, right? So we're all aware that, you know, a device is born, but then it goes through a whole life cycle that ends up with it being end of life and either decommissioned permanently or transferred to a different owner. So that life cycle becomes part of the zero trust model. And once you pair it with these nine core capabilities, you now have at least an operational framework, not the only operational framework. Um, and I'm not suggesting that every organization needs all nine of these things, but it becomes a way to think about how you can put zero trust into action for your IoT devices. So the next question becomes, okay, what about AI? What impact does that have on, on my zero trust project? What should I be thinking about? And I think it's important to understand some of the driving forces behind AI. Um, so it, in my background, I actually spent about a dozen years working for Microsoft. I actually uh, joined in 2004, right at the beginning of the Trustworthy Computing Initiative, if anybody remembers that, um, when zero trust actually had a different, different meaning. It was, a, I have zero trust in Microsoft security. 
my only joke, I promise. Um, but you know, one of the things that, that people don't understand is um, you know, that served as the foundation for what would become their initial machine learning initiative out of Microsoft Labs. And in 2011, when Azure was first released, one of the driving forces behind Azure was to put compute power in the hands of academic researchers who were doing cutting edge work on big data sets and machine learning models and all of that. Um, so it's no surprise that you know, Microsoft has come out and, and become one of the driving forces of you know, the current state of AI uh, with ChatGPT and, and, and OpenAI. So that is certainly one of the driving forces. I think secondly, um, there have been some great improvements in, in, in AI models and, and the tools that allow you to generate an AI. Um, and coupled with two things. One, lots of data, which wasn't always available before, and nearly ubiquitous and, and unlimited compute power. So it used to be that only certain organizations had a big data set and the computing power to actually process it. And, and now sort of that's become democratized. So many more organizations across lots of industries are finding ways to get access to data and crunch numbers and, and come up with a, a, you know, a meaningful improvement to their supply chain. Uh, and then lastly, I think you know, Wall Street is, is responsible because they see the potential for, um, for profitability and, and increases in supply chain efficiency among others with the use of AI. And there's some interesting data notes here from, from IBM that said actually coming out of the pandemic um, has really accelerated AI as well because organizations that are struggling to get their revenues back to where they were to you know, have the same um, outputs with fewer um, employees and to move things through the supply chain faster have found that AI generates some, some real um, returns on investment. Um, and it's no question when it comes to security that, that automation has a big impact as well. We know that you know, from that same data report, um, even limited use of AI when applied to security um, can have real material impacts, shortening how long it takes you to recognize a breach um, and reducing the amount of money it actually costs you for a particular breach. So those are both very powerful metrics. So you know, if we look at where AI is slated to have a big impact, certainly cybersecurity, I think we're all um, in agreement with that here. Um, being able to apply um, artificial intelligence, machine learning capabilities to these billions of endpoints represented by the IoT devices that we're all um, linked to somehow, um, absolutely uh, critical. Um, industrial, right? There's so many use cases where being able to um, create additional efficiencies by even 1% in your supply chain can yield um, significant increases in, in operating profitability. Certainly automotive um, with the use of, of autonomous driving systems, AI is critical to that. And then lastly, healthcare, right? So if I can get to a diagnosis faster um, and drive down the costs of healthcare and, and improve patient outcomes, that's a positive result for AI. Um, but there's this, this sort of inherent friction. So this gets to um, AI in the context of, of zero trust. There's an inherent friction between the way AI is applied today and what zero trust actually calls for. Um, and that's because most AI applications have this implicit trust relationship with the data they're using. And we go back to my definition of zero trust and this specifically called out, there can be no implicit trust between the, the resources you're using and, and the applications that they're talking to. And that's a real problem because when you think about in the medical industry, in the automotive industry, any regulated industry or, or an industry where you know, the value of the integrity of the device is paramount, using untrusted data um, can be worse than you, not using it at all. Um, and we actually need to get to this environment where we have an explicit trust relationship between the devices that are generating the data and the applications that are using the data um, to kind of create this closed loop or what I call an AI trust chain before AI and zero trust can kind of go hand in hand. And you know, there are some ongoing risks with, with AI and, and IoT, shortened to AIoT. Um, first of all, how do you maintain this trust relationship over time? Um, we talk about great scale. We talk about the complexity of different device environments. We talk about the life cycle of devices that are constantly in different states. It means that we have to pay close attention to this trust relationship. 
Um, how do you make sure that only the right applications are getting access to the data, and particularly um, you know, in, in vertical specific use cases? If, if this is you know, part of my, my IP, I want to make sure that only the authorized applications have access to that data. Uh, and then lastly, um, you know, how are you enabling this at the edge? Uh, where devices may not have compute power um, or they're offline for large periods of time because they're remote or, or they're air-gapped uh, intentionally for security purposes. Um, so we like to help our customers think through sort of what are the big picture things you have to do um, to, to maintain trust in an AI, AI, yeah, AIoT environment. Excuse me. Uh, first, follow a zero-trust approach, right? So it looks at eliminating weak credentials, establishing that strong foundation for zero-trust, um, and maintaining that over time, right? Typically, PKI technologies applied to devices um, is, is the best method today. Second, think about continuous assurance. So what does this mean? It means actually using external threat intelligence paired with the device's SBOM to always understand where those vulnerabilities might lie and take corrective actions preemptively, ideally. Um, and then lastly, which becomes very difficult in these, these disparate environments, how am I patching those vulnerabilities quickly to get my devices back to a known good state and, and back into operational order? Okay. So as I wrap up, um, I want to just kind of bring you back to that original NIST cybersecurity framework, and, and I want to ask you to sort of imagine um, a scenario where you know, we could have devices that will discover and authenticate themselves without human intervention. Um, imagine devices that automatically get assigned the right policy based on their attributes. Uh, imagine devices where anomalous behaviors are picked up by an AI and flagged, and either preventive actions are, are taken automatically or somebody is alerted to take action. Um, imagine if um, continuous assurance with an SBOM, which is something that was table stakes, and they could patch themselves based on an alert that says you have a vulnerability. And imagine if you know, recovery wasn't what you were worried about, but it was more discovery. How do I discover more devices that I'm going to bring online that are going to help me realize the benefits of, of IoT? Um, and so you know, device authority through our Keyscaler platform, we've been providing these automated technologies for zero trust since 2015. Um, and, and last year, right around this time, we actually released um, two new iterations of our platform. One is our enterprise SaaS version of Keyscaler called KSaaS, along with Keyscaler Edge that takes that automated zero trust capability and pushes it out to edge environments. Um, today for, for this conference, um, we're excited to announce a preview of Keyscaler AI, um, which press release just went out today. We're really excited to announce this. Um, that's going to help us realize this vision of providing continuous assurance to all IoT devices by Leveraging the SBOM, looking at uh, device behaviors, predicting where malware might, um, might intrude into the device, and always be checking for the hardware to make sure it's a valid, known good device. And in our first version, the preview that, we've, that we're releasing today, um, four key features that will be uh, um, available. And we have a demo to show you. Um, not here. Um, one is anomalous device detection, so it gives you the, the ability to see where devices are not behaving how they should and take automated corrective actions on them. Um, two is a retrainable model, so as you onboard more devices, um, the model will learn what a known good device looks like, and so a device that previously was not authenticated because it looked out of band now looks good, and the model will allow for that. Um, third is real-time integration with external threat intelligence platforms where we are going to go out proactively and in real time through the authentication session actually get known CVEs, apply that to the device's SBOM and tell you whether there's a threat and either allow the device or conditionally allow the device based on, on the, the, the grades that we receive. Um, and then lastly, greatly simplified device onboarding. What that means is the system can actually look at a device's hardware attributes, compare that to the known good attributes of devices that you've onboarded successfully, and let that come in without human intervention. So four big features we're excited to announce. Um, and you know, we, we ask you to come learn more. You can look at this QR code to our website, um, but also see us afterwards. We're happy to show you the demo and talk a little bit more about it. With that, I'm done. Um, I guess we'll.
see if there's, are we doing questions?